My name is Bernard Wolfstorff. I'm an immigration attorney here in Los Angeles. Um, we have offices in New York. And um, on the screen, you will see my email address. I actually encourage you all to email me questions. Um, there is no clock running when you email me. Our firm is Wolfstorff Immigration Law Group, and there's our telephone number. Really hard to remember, 1-800-VISA-LAW. So um, if you're uh, in doubt or have a question, uh, do feel free to call us. And uh, uh, we have 17 attorneys on staff available to answer any questions you have. Um, today's program, Visa Options, uh, is focused directly towards HR professionals. Um, we will be covering several uh, elements of uh, immigration practice, including the immigration law options. Uh, we will also be dealing with the all-important question of immigration compliance. As most of you are aware, uh, immigration is massively in play after the last election, and both our President Obama and Congress are grappling with immigration reform. Being the eternal optimist that I am, I do believe that there will be some form of immigration relief. Congress has to do something. It's been 20 years, over 20 years, since the Immigration Act of 1990 was passed. That means our quotas are now 21 years old. Um, if you have a master's degree from Stanford and you get a job offer from Google, uh, and you happen to be born in India or China, uh, green card processing can take anywhere from five to eight years. So we keep hearing this line, well, well, you need to stand in line. And the answer is, which line? Um, some of these lines are 10 years long. Some of them are 20 years long. And uh, quite frankly, some of them um, are beyond the life expectancy of, of many of the beneficiary. So um, we do have a system that's broken. However, this is not an advocacy panel. This is a nuts and bolts panel. And what we're going to do today is talk about immigration visa options for HR when hiring foreign nationals. We are also going to talk about immigration compliance. One of the things that I predict are going to happen with almost complete certainty is that we're going to have some form of mandatory E-Verify um, system. What is E-Verify? E-Verify is a system which will um, ensure that people who are hired are lawfully entitled to be employed. That is, of course, if they do not do identity theft. Because if they do identity theft, E-Verify won't catch them. And then, if we do E-Verify, we're going to have all these new wonderful problems, such as when a married woman or man, uh, men change their name less, but Ordinarily, a married woman doesn't change her social security card. So what happens? You have a problem. What do you do with this problem? Well, we're going to deal with some of these issues today. The other um, good news is um, please use your chat function. Um, at the end of this program, I am going to answer all your questions. And I will stay online. We have a schedule, but generally speaking, I do not end these programs until every single question has been answered. Um, so gear up, key up, put your questions in, and we'll be ready to go. Now, um, our next program, for those of you who are interested, is scheduled for March 21. We do regular programs on various different topics. Our next program, March 21, is really a focus for graduating students, OPT and beyond, which deals with the options that are available to uh, graduating students. And uh, of course, um, that's the other side of the coin that we're dealing with today. Today, we're dealing with an HR perspective and how to tackle immigration. We will cover the various non-immigrant visa options. We will cover the immigrant visa options. Uh, the other word for immigrant visa, of course, is green card. And then we're going to deal with immigration compliance. Now, cliche to talk about after 9-11, but something changed after 9-11. A new agency was created by the name of DHS. 
Department of Homeland Security with its three, at least three, branches, all of which deal with immigration. Firstly, we have USCIS, the adjudications branch, and we have CBP, Customs and Border Protection, which is, as it sounds, designed to protect our border, our border inspectors, and, of course, many other functions. Thirdly, we have ICE, which is Immigration Customs Enforcement. And, of course, the enforcement side of immigration uh, has now moved to ICE. We are dealing with what I would call hardcore enforcement folks. What is the other responsibility of ICE? Well, things like dealing with drug dealers, cartels, criminals, espionage, um, customs, smuggling. Um, this is a hardcore enforcement agency. And of course, they also have responsibility to deal with immigration enforcement. What kind of job are they doing? I'm not here to criticize. Um, but the fact of the matter is, over 400,000 people were deported last year. ICE is not an agency to play with. These are hardcore enforcement folks. And why are they after you, the employer? Well, very simple. In 1976, when Ronald Reagan passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act, more commonly known as IRCA, there were two sides to it. On the one hand, we're going to give amnesty to a few million undocumented. On the other hand, we are going to remove the lure, that's L-U-R-E, of um, jobs. Because what's bringing these folks to the United States are jobs. And what we're going to do is, since we can't police it completely, we're going to use the employer to, co to police it. And we are therefore going to require you, the employer, to verify that people are authorized to work. The truth is, however, is they create a system which encourages phony documentation because you are not document specialists. You, the employer, are not document specialists. So now we are moving towards an electronic database which will verify whether people who you see in front of you, the employer, are authorized to be employed. OK, enough uh, chatting. It's time to jump into the arena. Uh, remember, your chat column is working. Uh, we are available today. Um, that's a picture of me out there. Um, to be truthful, it's a little bit old. The beard's gone gray, but I think that's legal in the Internet world right now to use a picture um, that's a little bit outdated. Um, please excuse my wry humor, but this topic is not always fun, so I will throw in a couple corny jokes. Uh, you do not have to laugh, and if you do, I don't know that you're laughing anyway. Um, Although you could always email me, ha ha, or something like that. Then I'll know when my jokes work and they don't work. So um, our topic today, Immigration 101, Immigration Compliance, and Visa Options. So uh, let's kick on uh, with our first slide, Options for Hiring F1 Students or New Graduates. Um, curricular Practical Training, CPT. This is for certain students who are allowed to be employed during the school year. Um, graduate programs, generally speaking, they must have completed. The bottom line for you, the employer, is that if somebody does have CPT, they're authorized to be employed. What kind of documents do they produce? Well, nothing very interesting. Certainly, they don't have plastic employment authorization cards. They have an endorsed form I-20, that is the I-20 Certificate of Eligibility for Student Status. These are very hard uh, to I-9 because the variety of documents you need, three or four documents, to verify their right to be employed uh, is quite substantial. And there are limitations sometimes on the number of hours. However, CPT is a wonderful way to hire graduate students um, in the sciences, in business, various different programs. Okay. Let's move on to the more common version, optional practical training, was one student said to me the other day, optical practical training. I'm like, this is not optical practical training. Presumably their spell check uh, was not very good. It's not opti opti I'm 
I'm getting tongue tied myself. It's optional practical training. And I can only say one thing about OPT. It's wonderful, 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 and more wonderful. Now, why is it so wonderful? Well, from an employer's point of view, there's no federal tax withholding. Now, I'm not a tax expert, so don't expect me to give you any good tax advice, nor is this reliable advice. So uh, go read publication 515, I believe it is, by the IRS. It's only about 40 pages. And that is the uh, publication that employers need to look at with regard to withholding of taxes on foreign nationals. But I know a lot of companies don't do this. And they end up squandering thousands and thousands of dollars because OPT, F1s, J1s, um, they are, in fact, exempt from, um, I believe it is, FICA, uh, Social Security, and future federal unemployment. Kind of makes sense, right? I mean, you know, they're not going to get federal unemployment benefits, so why should they have deductions? So they can get 12 months of OPT um, after graduation. Um, sometimes people will apply for OPT to use it during summer vacations. And here's the big one, folks. This is very, very big. Rumor has it, I can't say it's true, is that Microsoft and others who are lobbying for this, and we now have a 17-month STEM extension. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So if we are hiring a computer science graduate, we can potentially get 12 months work authorization with a 17-month extension. Math is not my skill, so if I get this wrong, you know, help me along here, folks. 29 months of OPT. Now let's add another little flavor to this. If the person applies for an H-1B, they can get cap gap closing. Let's try that one more time. Cap gap closing. No, this is not a Dr. Seuss children's book reading. This is cap gap, not cat in the hat, hat in the cat. Um, sorry, I don't get that done right, but, you know, I have four kids, so, you know, I read a lot of Dr. Seuss, and, um, you know, my humor is not as good as his, but um, cap gap closing. What is that? H-1Bs are only effective October 1 if it is a new H-1B, and if it is not cap exempt, meaning you're working for a nonprofit research institution. So, in a nutshell, when a person is transitioning from OPT to H-1B, and the OPT ends in, say, July, and the H starts in October 1, cap gap closing will allow you to close that, bridge that gap of three or four months. So we get 12 months of OPT if we're in STEM. And if the employer is E-Verify registered, OK, this is the lure to encourage employers to register for E-Verify, you get 12 plus 17 is 29, and you can get cap gap closing for another few months, almost three years of work authorization, arguably with some tax withholding. And again, I don't give any tax advice. I'm not qualified to. If the employer is E-Verify compliant. Now, in some states, you don't have a choice. You better be E-Verify. And the question I always get is, well, if we register for E-Verify, does the whole company have to do it? And the answer is no. The government is quite generous in allowing only certain divisions uh, or units, as it were, to be E-Verified. And again, if you're a federal contractor, um, you had better be E-Verified if you are required under the current uh, framework. I'm not going to go too far. That's another whole webinar on who is mandatorily required, and we should do another one of those, an E-Verify only webinar. Um, but I found that there are many companies who are not in compliance. This makes me very nervous. Your federal contract is contingent upon your being E-Verify compliant, and I'm not sure that everybody is doing this, uh, but you better be. So. Um, that is that is sort of the strong mean Bernie here. Um, let's move on. E-Verify, what is it? Voluntary program? Well, yes, but not if you're in certain states and not if you're a substantial federal contractor. 
Now, how do we do this thing, e-verify? Well, there's the website. It's the usceis.gov website. So what is the big deal? I hope my, I hope my PowerPoint is current here because it changes every day. Um, I had a chart on this. Uh, Alabama, Arizona, Mississippi, South Carolina, Utah, Tennessee, mandatory. Many of those started January 1. We're now in February. Uh, did you miss the boat? I heard something about 30, 40 percent of Arizona employers are not online. They don't seem to get this one. Mandatory means everybody. Um, so those of you who um, are not in compliance, uh, maybe I didn't scare you enough. This is ICE, Custom, Immigration Customs and Enforcement. These are the guys who use wires. These are the guys who bust the Mexican cartel drug dealers. These are not your friends. Um, these are people, these are policemen, these are enforcement. And these are pretty sophisticated guys. So um, we don't mess with ICE. Um, they clearly like that name. Almost all employers in Louisiana, Georgia, and North Carolina and employers with federal contracts. Now, we want to register for E-Verify. What is it we need to do? Well, we have registered for E-Verify. Who's in charge? Well, here's the big, here's the big doodah. Memorandum of Understanding, the new word, MOU. This is an MOU between the employer, Department of Homeland Security, and SSA. And what's the memorandum going to say? When I last read it, it was 13 pages. I just love 13 pages of fine print. Keeps us lawyers fully employed. I just love reading 13 page documents in mumbo jumbo. At the end of the day, what is the employer doing? Well, the employer is surrendering some of its rights, of course. Um, I am a proud, proud, proud American, even though I've got a funny accent. That's a South African accent, or what I call my fake British accent, whichever way you want to go with it. Um, who's seen the movie Lincoln? Well, I have. Love the movie Lincoln. Uh, helps me understand. Bernie, can you get back to the topic? Well, no, I can't. Um, what did Lincoln remind me about? It reminded me about Congress and its dysfunctional manner. Apparently it's historical. And it reminded me about the great constitution this nation has, which um, I think has helped define. And one of the things our great constitution does is it gives people some rights, which is nice. Good to have rights. What does the MOU do? It takes away those rights. You can waive some of those rights to search and seizure and under the MOU, if you're participating in E-Verify, you waive many of your rights to inspection and the government can sort of just walk in. Uh, under the current I-9, what is an I-9, Bernie? Stop. I-9 is the form you have to fill out within three days of hire when you are, and we have a separate webinar on that one, um, when you are hiring anybody. It's not for foreigners, not for people with funny accents like me, everybody. If you are hiring somebody on United States soil, you have to complete Form I-9 within three days of hire. And if you don't, you are in violation of the law. And can you fix it if you're one week late? No. If you backdate it, who knows what's going to happen? Maybe you'll go to jail. Wait a second, Bernie. Are you scaring me? Yes, I am scaring you. This isn't something to play with. 99% is a terrible score. We need 100% compliance on I-9. And if you're going for E-Verify, you have to sign the Memorandum of Understanding. And you have to read it. And you have to understand it. And you have to be advising the legal counsel and the HR counsel and everybody what it means to sign this. Because, you know, you might just find a week later or a month later or six months later that people with uniforms are going to come walking to your office, maybe carrying a copy of this MOU saying, we want to see your records. We want to see your electronic I-9 records, we want to see your paper I-9 records, and we want them now. And you're like, well, hmm, I don't know. That's in a drawer somewhere. Uh, who's got it? Who's responsible? Folks, you're responsible. HR, you need to make sure that your I-9 framework is 100% up to date before you sign this MOU, not after you do it. And if you're in one of the mandatory states, well, you know what? 
The trains left the station. And here's my point, if it's not clear. Here's my point. Congress is going to do immigration reform this year. I believe they will. They're grappling with it right now. Why did Romney lose the election? Some people will say it was the immigration issue. Some people will say that President Obama harnessed the immigration issue by giving some form of relief to the kids, picked up the Latino vote, picked up the Asian vote. He also picked up the woman vote and various other votes. I'm not getting into politics here. I'm talking facts. The demographic is such, I live in California, um, there's a Latino majority in California. That's the reality. I'm happy with it. I'm comfortable with it. But the simple reality is the demographics are such that immigration is majorly in play if you're looking at the, the national character of the United States. And verifying people's right to be employed is very much in play. And E-Verify is the instrument that we're going to use. Okay, so we have to complete the I-9 and run an electronic query through an automatic database linked with SSA that is becoming more sophisticated. The error rate is being reduced and they are introducing photo tools. So several driver's licenses of several states are now accessible online. So you want to do this um, identity theft thing? Well, you know what? Uh, you've got a problem because you're going to have to fool the DMVs. And now all of you love working for with DMVs, right? The favorite department. Well, why are they so strict? Well, they're so strict because they don't want to make they want to make sure that the person in front of them doesn't have fake ID. They want to make sure that the person in front of them is the person they claim to be. So if you get turned away from the DMV, it's because the DMV needs to comply with real ID. What is real R E A L? not movie real, I know the Oscars are coming up, but real ID requires the DV, Department of Motor, blah, 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 let's try again, Department of Motor Vehicles, to ensure that they are very, very thorough before they issue ID that will allow you to get on a plane. Um, why did that happen? Well, we had something called I-9. Those guys had, those bad guys, those rotten bad guys, had fake IDs. So we don't want to be given IDs, fake IDs to the wrong people. So that's what this is all about, is creating a database that works. Um, some people say that E-Verify won't work, and the only way is to go with a national ID card. Will we have a national ID card? Oh my gosh, I don't know. That's another whole big thing. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. I think there's a lot of issues there. But let's focus on our topic, E-Verify. This, when you run through the system, you can get, let's just call it green light, yellow light, red light. Okay? Green light, employment authorized, good. Put the person to work. Yellow light, TNC, what do you do? Got a problem. Put them to work for a certain period of time, send them down to the SSA, Social Security Office, and have them to get their documents fixed within 30 days. Now, my second favorite office after the DMV is the Social Security Office. It's been a long time since I've been there. I got my card when I was oh, pretty young. Um, and I think I know where the original is, because you're not allowed to use a copy. You're not even allowed to laminate your Social Security card. So you've got a 40-year-old Social Security card that looks like the dog chewed it. And that's the official document, because you laminate it. It's invalid. You've got to go down to get a replacement. Oh, my gosh. You know, put a pitchfork in my head. Um, rather put a face chalk in my head. Hey, I shouldn't use like southern analogies. Um, although I do come from southern Africa, so you know, but I shouldn't use. It's just that the southern analogies are so much more accurate and so much um, more colourful. Um, um, all right, let's take that pitchfork out of my head. Um, try and put my brains back in there and answer our questions. It, we're running through the E-Verify database. We get an employment authorized, we get a tentative non-confirmation, we get a TNC, and we've got some problems and we've got to go down and fix them. And this is um, the new system that is very much in place. Okay, is this process correct for you? I've already given you the focus. The big lure is the bottom there is the STEM extensions. 
Um, the government is using E-Verify as the carrot, which will encourage employers um, to hire, uh, to use the program if they wish to hire all those wonderful smart graduates. And I always see these statistics, what's it, 50, 60 percent of PhD graduates, um, schools like MIT and Caltech, um, 40, 50 percent foreign nationals, wow. Um, you know, if you want the top folks in the sciences and you're going to exclude 40, 50 percent, um, you're narrowing the pool. And uh, I think employers want the best and the brightest. The good news is I think Congress is finally getting the fact that America needs the best and the brightest. We are finally discovering that we have competition. From who? China, India, um, all of these countries and many others now are competing on a tech basis with the United States. We need the best and the brightest. How are we going to keep them? We are going to use OPT. And we're going to get STEM extensions. But before we do that, we have to register for E-Verify. All right, many of you have already registered for E-Verify. That is wonderful. There are 7 million employers. E-Verify is becoming very, very popular. This is the future. I do believe we've had bills in Congress uh, to make it mandatory. I think that there's a decent chance it's going to happen this year. So um, the bottom line is, to some degree, um, I've never really been in favor of E-Verify, but I'm starting to say, ah, shucks, I think we have to throw in the towel. I don't think we're going to fight, um, I don't think we're going to fight the government on this one. Um, although we do need to be aware that the government is using this as a tool to spy on you. Wait, stop, what did you just say? I said the government is using this as a tool to data mine. So if you're going to use it, make sure you know what you're doing, please. Um, you could just have a little bit of a problem if you don't know what you're doing. So pros and cons. Memorandum of, I've already said most of these things. Memorandum of understanding gives ICE broad access to company records. Yippee, yippee, yippee. Increases exposure to government audits. DHS is data mining. Look, you can all read. I've already mentioned most of these points. Controversy or controversy, everybody makes fun of me over the way I pronounce that word, over the accuracy of databases. Problem is I've lived in America for 30 years. So I don't know which is my original pronunciation, which is the American version, and I get all confused. Um, concern about lack of available resources and funding of the program? Hmm, I think that's out of date. They have lots of money. Where do they get their money from? They get their money from finding you, the employer. It's like, I'm in Santa Monica here. Where does Santa Monica get their money from? Parking meters. I'm convinced. One minute over twice in the last three weeks, 64 bucks a pop. That'll teach me. I'm not going to be one minute over in the future. Um, I don't know how they managed to catch me within one minute. Um, but they did. So um, they've got plenty of resources. ICE is making lots of money, collecting millions of dollars of fines. Um, now, what is this next one? Increased risk of wrongful termination. Yep. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, if you, the employer, make a mistake and you terminate somebody who is lawfully authorized to be employed, uh, you've got a problem. You may have a discrimination problem. Um, so what is the system right now? Very confusing. Different states, some require it, some don't require it. Some were even prohibiting uh, uh, employers from implementing, but that's kind of on hold right now, so uh, less of a problem. Is it right for you? You may not have a chance. So we'll probably do another program just on E-Verify. We do a program on I-9s. Let's move forward and talk about non-immigrant visas. All right, you've got your OPT. Uh, your OPT is about to extend. You've got your STEM extension, 12 plus 17, 29 months. You've got your cap gap closing and you now want to keep this individual in the United States, so you want to file an H-1B. Very controversial little visa. Everybody knows about it. Subject to a quota. Um, here's the big deal. April Fool's Day, April 1. The government is not playing a joke on you. They're playing a joke on me because we always have something called March Madness. March Madness is when my office ends up, ugh, big sigh. Um, having to put together all our H-1Bs so they can arrive on April 1 or as soon thereafter as possible. 
Now, this kind of happened from 2003 to 2009. With the slowdown, the quota never got used up. There are only 65,000 H-1Bs a year for CAP subject and an additional 20,000 for U.S. master's degrees, total 85,000. When you think of the hundreds of thousands of international students and professionals that companies want to bring, um, some tech companies will tell you U.S. needs not hundreds of thousands or 80,000 or 65,000. Some people will say we need hundreds of thousands maybe a million workers to meet the future in terms of the aging population. The fact of the matter is, is that birth rates are declining. There's less young people. If we don't have immigration, um, young people coming in to help generate revenue to pay for all of us old folks like me, um, I'm not 60 yet, but I'm getting close to it, um, we need some more young people to put money in the social security system so it can pay my social security benefits um, yeah, I really need that check. Um, and the question is, do we have enough young people coming in? We have this wonderful immigration system, by the way. We let a lot of people in, and we let them in through a family system with these incredible waiting lines. So by the time they get their green card, they're 75 or 80. That's really smart. Let's allow all the 80-year-olds to immigrate to the United States. Um, very, very smart. But let's not, let's not allow all the smart young computer science graduates coming out of Stanford and Harvard and UCLA and all these, no, 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 we don't want them. We just want the 80-year-olds um, to come in and um, seriously, folks, I'm not kidding. Our system is rigged to benefit family immigration. We do give out a lot of green cards every year. Well, not me personally, but the U.S. government issues, um, gosh, how many, um, you know, close to a million green cards a year. But over 75% of them go to family immigration. And um, that isn't always smart. Um, isn't always smart. I, I think Congress is focused on the fact that we need to uh, focus on the needs of you, the employer. And um, we're going to see some changes, I hope. Are we going to see some improvements in the H-1B arena? Well, I have to tell the truth. I took kind of an oath about that. Um, you know. I think we're going to see more regulation. I think we're going to see more restrictions. The H-1B program is now micromanaged by the Labor Department. And uh, actually, there's going to be even more restrictions. So we want to hire people, um, technical people, engineers, scientists, etc. Uh, we are not a university or nonprofit research institution. So we're subject to a cap. We file what is the basic requirement, bachelor's degree or foreign equivalent or combination. Um, yeah, well, really, the requirement is you have to prove that that position requires at minimum a baccalaureate level person. I was reading the New York Times earlier this week. And there was this wonderful article about how a filing clerk in New York needs a bachelor's degree. Are you going to get an H-1B for a filing clerk? No way. Um, is a bachelor's degree required? to get a job in New York, apparently, according to the New York Times, it is. So uh, do we have a disconnect here? Yes, we do. Um, I think, and this is only what I'd call a Bernie theory, that immigration is really looking and say, come on, how sophisticated is this job? Um, is an American who could do the job? That's not the test, by the way. The test is basically for a specialty op occupation is that a minimum of a bachelor's degree is required to do the job but pretty much everything falls into that position. So there's our little quota. Fiscal year starts from October 1. That is the immigration fiscal year. <coughs> Excuse the puff there, folks. Um, starts October 1. And um, April 1 is the date that you get to file for your H-1B if you're a CAP subject. And you can file six months in advance. So um, let's do some math here. Um, six months plus four months equals 10 months. That brings us to April 1, 65 for the fiscal year. And then, of course, we've got all the little exceptions. If you come from Singapore, you come from Chile, uh, special uh, requirement. Those are free trade agreements. We get 20 for U.S. graduates, so that's the cap. Um, these are the exempt folks, uh, really nonprofit research, institutes of higher education, universities, and here's the complicated one. Those nonprofit organizations that are affiliated with. That's magical language, by the way. 
what is affiliated with mean? Um, that's another one hour webinar, by the way, seriously. Uh, are you affiliated with and can you get the cap? But um, let's move over. H1B, filing fees. I just love these. Uh, Bernie, add all this stuff up. How much does it cost? Well, hey, try, you know, over $3,000 government filing fee, particularly if you're going to do premium processing. And, well, that's fine. I'll just pass these costs on to the foreign national. Oh, no, no, no. No, 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 no. No, you don't. How many times did I say no there? I say this because a lot of employers are doing it, but they may get themselves into trouble. Um, some people say that um, some of these fees you can pass on to the foreign national. Uh, please be careful with that, uh, particularly if so doing, you're going to reduce the prevailing wage. What is the prevailing wage? The prevailing wage is the median wage. This is the biggest problem we're having with H-1Bs right now. The Department of Labor will publish H-1B wages, but the problem is these are median wages. And often you're hiring these kids straight out of college on OPT, first job ever, switch them over to an H-1, and it's like, oh, well, I'm sorry, the prevailing wage is X. And you're like, what? X? You're crazy? Yes, sometimes this job will make you crazy. HR will make you crazy. Let's stop that. Um, the stresses we deal with are, are pretty serious because it's like, well, just get this done. We really need this. You know, the engineering manager needs this guy. He's critical. We're on this huge project. And I'm like, yeah, but the prevailing wage is 119000 for this job. And it's like, dope. Okay. Um, we've got a little problem here. Well, you know, who's going to know? We'll just pay him X. Who's going to know? Are you kidding? Um, they're auditing about 20,000 of these a year. 20,000 out of 85, uh, let me do my math, get my calculator, 20 into 85, 1 in 4, uh, I'm not that bad in math, but the truth is if I have to go beyond 10, I will have to take off my shoes because I can't count without my fingers and toes. Um, all right, that wasn't funny, Bernie. Um, premium processing, what is that? That sounds like first class. I want that. 1,225, I hate premium processing. Premium processing is where the government has to make a decision within two weeks, and they hate doing it, so you often get requests for evidence. You don't need to do this. Why don't you need to do it? Well, you've got cap gap closing. What's cap gap closing? Bernie, you explained that earlier. Cap gap closing is the gap between the end of OPT, the end of optional practical training, and the start of the H-1B on October 1. And if you file and pay premium processing, the other word for premium processing is highway robbery. Highway robbery, premium processing, same thing. Um, the government holds you hostage for $1,225 and uh, gives you a decision within um, two weeks. Often a bad decision. But anyway, uh, what is this training fee? Um, that is one of the add-on fees for an H-1B. The amount varies. Um, there's a fraud fee. Uh, what is that? that? I just mentioned. That's for being investigated. You have to pay $500 to have an inspector come out and check that everything that you say on the H-1B is true. So I find this, employers say to the foreign national, oh, just go out and hire yourself a lawyer, and they go to Yellow Pages, and they download, I just love the internet, H-1B free, do-it-yourself kit. Um, soon they're going to have like open heart surgery, do-it-yourself kit with a free scalpel. Um, and then we're going to have dead patients. Um, I see these every day, uh, what I call mucked up cases. Uh, we're dealing with some serious agencies here. Department of Labor, and if I've tried to scare you with ICE, um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and I've tried to scare you with USCIS, not really. They're kind of fairly reasonable, a little bit restrictive, but the Department of Labor, wage an hour, be afraid, folks. Um, since you're all HR, I didn't need to tell you that. You all know how DOL, DOL works. I have a case right now. Um, of course, I have to keep confidentiality, but started off with an H-1B investigation, and yesterday I got a call from a panicked employer about how it's now turned into a DOL uh, FLSA investigation, Fair Labor Standards Act investigation. So, you know, this is serious stuff. One federal agency feeds the other federal agency, feels a third one, and, you know, you need to do this all right. And there is a way to do it right. There's no reason to be afraid. We file H-1Bs every day. We get our approvals. But you have to do it right. I always say to H-1B employers, can I have a look at your public access file? And they think I'm like, my what? Your public access file, that's what we inspect during an audit. 
Well, no one told me about that. Mm, you got another one of those internet lawyers, huh? Those internet kits. Okay, you need to have a public access file. You need to have certain documentation in there. So let's talk some more about H1B. It's employer specific, so that foreign national can only work for you. Of course, they can have two. Could be part time, full time, concurrent. I have a dentist with three different H1Bs. Six year maximum. Oh yeah, cap out problem. This is wonderful. We get to year five. The person has become critical to your company. Hasn't the file for a green card. What are you going to do? Go home. That's what you're going to do. You're going to send them home. You're going to lose the employee. So you have to apply for a green card before year five at the point four and a half. Doesn't create a contract. It's at will employment, but do have a separate employment contract just to make sure that filing for three years. So H1B is granted in three years with a three year extension. And here's the good news. If you file for a green card called PERM or any other employment based system, you can actually extend beyond the six years. Now let's go back to my earlier discussion. I mentioned that the waiting line for Indians and Chinese under the master's degree category, five, six, seven, eight years. So in order to get up there and keep your employees legal, you have to file H-1Bs um, until your place in the waiting line comes up. H-1B process, uh, I'm not going to go in the nitty gritty here. Um, USCIS, Department of Labor, you file with the Department of Labor, they verify your federal employer ID number, you keep your public access file, must pay the prevailing wage. I've covered all of this. We're getting approvals in seven to ten days. Um, your attestation, labor condition attestation, very important document. You certify that you're going to pay the same benefits as offered to U.S. workers. Please do not look at the H-1B as a way to bring in cheap labor and to exploit foreign workers. It's not the way to do it. Department of Labor will hurt you. Must keep public access file. Submit to the Department of Labor. You get your certification and then uh, Department of Labor gets to come and inspect you and audit you and make sure that you're in compliance. All right, let's talk about the H-1B process. Submit your application to USCIS, support letter, petition, government filing fees. Processing time, regular, three to five months. Uh, Bernie, uh, let's stop again. Uh, did you say five months? Uh, yes. And uh, five months is five months, huh? It's not 180 days, that would be six months. Actually, six months could be more than 180 days. Uh, yeah, I'm just pointing out that you could file your H-1B in the month of August, come October 1, and you still don't have adjudication because you didn't file it five months early. Well, actually, this year you pretty much are going to have to file it because we're expecting that H-1Bs are going to run out really quickly. And then you have to pay premium processing. What's the other word for premium processing? Highway robbery. So plan early, folks. Save yourself the $1,225. Um, and then what happens? You file premium processing, you get an approval, or you get an RFE. What do you get? You get an RFE. What's an RFE? Request for evidence. You didn't give me enough. I want this. Nitpicking. We want more. We want more. Give me more. What if you don't give me more? You get a denial. All right, so what are the responsibilities of an employer under the H-1B? Additional work sites, change in work sites, requires an amendment, requires a new petition. This is the biggest headache we've got at the moment. One of the biggest headaches called roving employees um, and the rules. The rules are so complicated, seriously, I could do a webinar on this. The bottom line is the government wants the LCA to cover that area of employment. Well, what if the person works at 20 different client sites? And what if they're going to be stationed at those client sites for an extensive period of time? Well, then you have to do a posting notice at that client side. And um, then you have the issue of control. Who's controlling the right to uh, employ, uh, to supervise that employee? So that is a huge, huge issue. Uh, and it particularly relates to the so-called outsourcing companies, um, the big um, outsourcing companies that are, quite frankly, uh, the primary users or a primary user of the H-1B program. By the way, I have to say this. Um, Yes, I'm a lawyer. Yes, I'm an immigration law specialist. Yes, I think I know what I'm doing in this arena. But this is not legal advice. Nothing in this recording will constitute legal advice. You want legal advice, reach out to me separately. So, okay, H-1B, uh, biggest problem, work sites, change in work sites. What do you do if there's a change, requires an amendment? Quite frankly, any material change in an H-1B 
requires an amendment, arguably a new LCA, labor condition adaptation, termination. Oh, my favorite one. What happens? Under the American Competitiveness and Workforce Improvement Act, also known as ACQUIA, um, the workers are protected. And if you are terminated, you meaning the foreign national, you must offer the reasonable cost of transportation home. So you fire me, you're going to send me back to South Africa? No, I'm an American citizen with a funny accent. So, uh, but if you hire someone on an H-1B and you terminate them, you're required to pay the reasonable cost of transportation back. We call this the Moscow Circus provision. Yes, folks, uh, the Moscow Circus came a long time ago, got stranded, and so they passed this. Um, you fire somebody on an H-1O, you have to pay their return airline tickets, and you must notify USCIS. What if you don't notify USCIS? Ooh, I love this one, folks. You're on the hook. How much are you on the hook for? Well, you just got to keep paying the salary. So if you terminate someone on an H-1B, make sure you withdraw that H-1B. Mm, okay, so you told the foreign national to go and hire the employer. The, the, the attorney is not representing you, the employer. Do they have an obligation to tell you about this? Hmm, probably. Um, the point is you need to have your own lawyer monitoring the H-1B process. Every time the foreign national hires their lawyer, are they protecting the employer and in many instances, you, the HR manager, and the answer is maybe not. So um, anyway, use of contractors, that's the whole big thing about third-party placement and control, what we call the new, the, the new felt memo, uh, big issue, lots of RFEs, and that is because the government, the Labor Department, really wants to control the outsourcing companies who are, as I say, major users of the H-1B. Uh, who's responsible for the fees? Um, you know, you can ignore this. This is my aggressive approach. I'm still arguing that some fees can be paid by the foreign national. Many of my colleagues um, disagree with me. The training fee, absolutely by the employer. I'm saying the forward fee is either my staff are arguing with me and saying no. Um, you know, we can argue that forever. Legal fees can be paid by either. Many say no, only the employer. But I can tell you one situation where it is definitely only the employer, and that is if you are paying exactly the prevailing wage. So if the prevailing wage is 60000 and uh, the legal fee is uh, $200, <laughs> um, then um, if the foreign national pays that $200, that will reduce their compensation package below uh, the prevailing wage, and that is not allowed. The employer would have to pay the $200. Okay, so the simple bottom line is that legal fees are deemed to be uh, an essential part of the requirement um, to, um, to provide the so-called tools to do the work. That's the Department of Labor rule, of course. H-1B audits, um, fraud investigation, FDNS, fraud detection, and national security. Um, I'm talking too much, so uh, getting a little bit uh, horsey here. Um, I apologize for that. Um, lots and lots and lots of audits going on, fraud investigation, work site. Um, just a little uh, shot of water there. Um, work site investigations. Um, kind of scary. These guys come along. No notice. Well, hold on, I want to bring my lawyer. No, 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 no. We don't need to wait for your lawyer. Um, you do not have a right to counsel. <coughs> I shouldn't be so flippant about this, but um, they always are unannounced. Unannounced. That's the flavor of the game. Well, be ready for them. Make sure you know where your public access files, and make sure everything is truthful, folks. You do not need to be afraid of an audit. You only need to be afraid when you're not telling the truth. So people make funny stuff up. People hire lawyers that make funny stuff up. Don't do it. We have something called an online presence. Government can find out what job that person is doing. The government knows what the job duties are, and they will come in with a camera and ask questions. Hey, what does that guy do? They'll ask other people. They'll nosy around, and the government always wins. Sorry, um, these guys do their job well. 
So uh, timing issues. This is the big one, at least for this year. Uh, you can look at all those dates, but basically, um, here's the bottom line. Look at the, part, the final point. Cap reached June 11, 2012. All right, let me take my shoes off. I'm going beyond 10. Um, last year, the H-1B program opened April 1 and closed June 11. So that was just over 60 days. Uh, previously, it closed November 22. Let's add another June, July, August, September, blah, blah, blah. That one took, you know, whatever that is, six or seven months. So the simple bottom line went from a seven-month H-1B season down to a two-month H-1B season. Predictions for this year, fishing season, um, I'm a little getting all confused, H-1B season, um, hey, why are you talking about fishing season? It's the NLG. The simple bottom line is there's going to be maybe 30 days. Some people are talking about it running out within a week. Bottom line is if you, the employer, want to do an H-1B, don't play. Be ready to file April 1. Does that scare them lawyer stuff? Yes. Am I going to be right? Who knows? Who knows what the economy is doing? Bottom line is tech hiring is up massively. So um, get ready to file your H-1Bs on April 1, or uh, maybe you have to wait how long? 18 months. Bernie, could you repeat that? 18 months. Why do I do this Bob Dole thing? I keep referring to myself in the third person. I am not Bob Dole. I have respect for Bob Dole and more respect for Elizabeth Dole. Um, stop making silly jokes, Bernie. Nobody finds this funny. Yeah, but this is a boring thing. Um, Bernie, would you stop talking to yourself? Um, yes, okay. Um, sorry, folks, I have little children. I have an eight-year-old, and I do this all the time with him, and he tells me to stop being silly, Daddy. Um, but you know what? Um, silly is kind of fun. So bottom line is we anticipate the cap is going to be reached uh, very quickly, a week or two, um, maybe by the end of April, it's all gone, and then you're going to have to wait 18 months to get an H-1B, because it's not going to be until, let's try this, October 1, 2014. Repeat, October 1, 2014 is the first time you're going to be able to hire an H-1B if you miss the cap, scratch that, if you miss the H-1B fishing season. So uh, let's go on. Uh, new rules. Why haven't I updated my slide? They're not that new anymore. Um, cap gap relief, I already spoke to you. That's about closing the gap between the end of OPT and the beginning of H1B. And if you didn't catch it, that's because I didn't explain it well. And it's very complicated. But the bottom line is your F1 status is automatically expend, extended. And your OPT optional practical training, that's not optical practical training, my new bad joke, uh, is automatically extended. So. Okay, let's do our little chart. Graduation, June 2013. OPT starts July 2013. File your H-1B next year, April 1. OPT ends July 2014, one year from the time it starts. And your H-1B only starts October 1, 2013. So if you see the red arrow there, cap gap, relief covers the foreign national during that period. And don't start asking me how to I-9 them. Just remember to calendar all those dates. So um, that's your bottom line. If you're not selected and the cap cap relief ends upon rejection or denial or revocation, they've got a 60-day grace period. Um, that's a grace period, not an employment authorization period, to pack your bags, terminate the lease, and go home. Okay, H-1B portability, really quick. That's portability. Always well, sounds weird. It sounds like a port -a party or something. Portability is when you have an H-1B, you can jump over to a new H-1B. And the nice thing is you don't have to wait for the approval. You just do this upon filing, even the FedEx receipt. So don't pay premium processing. Just refile your H-1B as soon as you get the receipt, the person can start walk, working. I prefer the immigration receipt. Uh, exception, oh, this is the cap gap extension where somebody is jumping from cap exempt to cap subject. Um, very complicated situation, but be aware of that. If somebody has an H-1B and they haven't been counted in the quota and then they file, uh, you have a problem with um, portability. Um, issues with portability, 
Oh, there's so many. Um, I'm not really going to get into portability too much. Um, the solution is often to premium process. It just solves your problem. Um, but portability allows the individual basically to work during the four or five months. So if somebody has an H-1B and they have been counted and you want to hire them, you don't have to worry about all my scarum stuff. What's my scarum stuff? My scarum stuff is you need to be ready to file your H-1 on April 1. But if the person already has an H-1B because they're working for another for-profit commercial company, uh, you don't have most of these problems. H-1B scenario, what do you do? Um, sometimes people have been outside the United States. You can recapture the time, blah, blah, blah. Time limits, I already spoke about that. Um, Six-year cap, recapture time spent abroad. Myths about H-1B. I'm going to flash through some of this stuff because it's not that interesting. Um, you know, small companies can't do it. Startups can't do it. Um, Self-employment, technically it's possible nowadays uh, if you have an independent board. The big issue is right of control. Can you hire or fire that foreign national? So, or can that foreign national set up his own company, file an H-1B, fire himself, only if it's an independent board? Um, other myths cannot go to school on an H-1B. They can go to school, but it's got to be part-time. Spouses, this is a problem. You know, spouse comes here for six years, can't work, needs their own H-1B, uh, can, go to, can go to school, etc., but can't work on an H-1B. What are the other alternatives? I spoke about this, Chile, Singapore, no problem, 18 months, no portability, no immigrant intent. Um, that is no immigrant intent allowed. Uh, they can change to a regular H-1B, but they're going to be subject to the cap again. So that's for Chileans, Singaporeans. Uh, let's move on. NAFTA. Do we like NAFTA? Yes, we like NAFTA. So all Canadians and Mexicans can get work visas under NAFTA? Absolutely not. You need to look at the schedule, the professional list. It's very restrictive. Canadians apply at the border, can get up to three years. We shouldn't use the word visa because Canadians don't have visas. Their visas are exempt. Mexican nationals, limited to one year but entitled to a three-year admission. Boy, this stuff's complicated, okay, because everybody gets it wrong. Remember, folks, it's the I-94 card, the little white card that controls. The only problem with that, of course, is they're about to scrap the I-94, so don't even go there. Um, no immigrant intent in the yard. What is that? Well, you know, if a Canadian comes over on a tee and says, I want to live in America, we kick him out. Kick him home. Let's try and talk English. We kick him out. Um, we kick her out. Um, they're not allowed to have immigrant intent. Immigration law is so silly. You're not allowed to desire to live in America. Okay? If you do, we deport you. So a student says, I love America. I want to live here. Let's deport him. Let's deport her. Is this the system? Yes. Come on a tourist visa. Come on a B1. Oh, I love your country. I'd love to live here. All right? Arrest him and deport him. Oh, big sigh. Okay, uh, what's the exception to that? It's called an H and an L. Uh, H visa and a dual uh, L visa, those are dual intent visas. They are allowed to love America and want to stay here. Um, folks, I'm not joking. This is serious stuff. Um, actually, if you're in the immigration business, you better understand dual intent because the H and the L allow it. Nothing else really does, but it gets more complicated from there on. Spouses of Canadians and Mexicans, TDs, uh, look, these are great categories. You can process them really quickly, no five months, and the government filing fee is, yes, don't you just love it, for Canadians, 50 bucks at the border. Put a package, send it to your Canadian, go to the border, make sure you comply with the rules, and your Canadian gets to work. Um, so great if they meet those categories. What about the Australians? Yes, we like Australians. I should not do accents because I have my own, uh, so I won't do the Aussie accent. Um, some people mistake me for an Australian sometimes. Um, hmm, what's the story? Another good visa. Basically, it's like an H-1B, two-year work visa, renewable, apply at the embassy in Australia. They can actually apply at any embassy or consulate. Um, here's the groovy thing. Yeah, I'm from the 60s, folks. I use the word groovy. Um, not to be mistaken with gravy, which is what you put on your food. 
Um, that joke didn't work. Spouses can apply for work permits, unrestricted employment authorization. Wow, this is cool. Okay, so the Aussie spouses can get work authorization. Sometimes we get pretty creative. We apply for the work visa only so the spouse can have the derivative work visa. Take about 90 days to work, but this is cool. So you want unrestricted work permit? Have your wife get, stop that Bernie, have your spouse get a work permit and um, you can work for anybody. So what can I say? It's a good one. Um, Australians, and why did we get that? We got that to reward Australia for fighting uh, in our wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Korea. The Australians always volunteer to fight with America at its side and the reward is an E3. Bernie, you're joking. Bernie is not joking. That's the reality. We rewarded them for involvement with Iraq and um, that's the reality. Um, fight with America, get a visa. Um, okay. Um, I hope you can tell when I'm joking and not joking. Um, what do we got here? L1B. Ah, my other favorite visa. I'm going fast on this. This is for um, multinational companies. Um, at least two flavors, managers, executives. The other one is specialized knowledge. There is a third one for blanket L's. That's big companies that hire at least a thousand employees worldwide or have 25 million in sales for US companies. They get blankets and they can move their people around. So what is the requirement? You have to be working for the overseas company for at least a year. That kind of stymies a lot of people. Don't make it up. Please don't do that. Um, the government's smart. They want proof. And they come into the United States to fill a executive manager or specialized knowledge position. Looks simple, right? Go to the internet. Really simple. Executive manager specialized knowledge. So why then are so many of these cases denied? Well, you know what? If I manage a grocery store with two employees in South Africa and I open up a grocery store with two employees in the US to transfer myself, that is perceived as a trick to immigrate and I'm probably going to end up slipping up. So, you know, small companies have problems. Specialized knowledge. What does that mean? Oh gosh, that's a three-hour webinar. Um, you know, just think of it as some unique, uh, unique type of knowledge that's not widely held within the organization. There's debates as to whether it has to be widely held within the organization, widely held within the field. Just, folks, it's got to be unique. It's got to be specialized. If any American can just be hired to fill that, you're not going to qualify. Okay, blanket L. I already spoke about that. Um, you don't have to file with immigration. They're really fast. Just got one approved yesterday. I was so happy. Oh my gosh, they just picked me on it. Um, but it's really good because this company can now uh, transfer its major employees. If you are a large company and you meet this definition, U.S. employees a thousand. That's hard. What about this other one? U.S. subsidiaries and affiliates. So the U.S. entities have sales of 25 million not so difficult anymore. So you've got that, you're eligible for a blanket, this is the way to transfer employees. Folks, one more time, if your company has sales of 25 million in the United States and you uh, have branches abroad and you transfer foreign nationals into the United States, you need to have a blanket. Call 1-800-VISA-LAW. That is my number, of course. Uh, email me, or if you have counsel, call your counsel and say, why don't I have a blanket? Well, you didn't tell me about it. You didn't ask for it. Hey, your immigration counsel, you're supposed to tell me what I need. If you're my client, um, that would be a different rule. Um, why haven't I told you about it? I've done marketing in this area. Sometimes you can only do so much marketing without irritating your clients. Um, L1B, total of seven years. L1, scratch that. L1A, manager executive, seven years. L1B, specialized knowledge, five years. Spouses get work permits. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. Fast track a green card? Oh, this is a bonus. Mm -hmm. It's like the Ginsu knives. And, folks, in addition, you get one free extra green card. Yes, yes, yes. 
fast track green card EB1. Um, okay, what are you talking about, Bernie? Well, you get an L1, you can flip them over. I just got some approvals last month for a major company. This is a big one. Um, within three months, start to finish, file for the green card. You hear these stories about people waiting eight years for a green card? Yep, managerial transfers, flip them over, good cases can be approved within two to three months from start to finish. In reality, I like to tell clients it takes about a year. All right, we're in LA here. So, but this is not LA, by the way. O1 alien of extraordinary ability in arts, motion, picture, and TV. Look, there's three types of O1s. O1 is the visa for extraordinary people. Who's extraordinary? Those people who have skill and recognition significantly above that ordinary encountered, painting by numbers, three out of the, three out of ten criteria. Um, you know, this person can't just be ordinary. Um, they're going to come and work in the arts, motion pictures. Arts, that includes culinary arts. There's your chef, your famous chef, your famous actor, your famous TV, uh, your famous fashion model. Um, yes, we do a lot of these cases. Uh, we file them all the time. Hit three out of ten, and basically you may be eligible for an O-1. Um, let's move on here. Uh, extraordinary ability in arts, science, business, or education. This is the highest standard, folks. Extraordinary. What does it mean? It's a different standard. One, the person who's reached that small percentage uh, are people who are at the top of their field. So here you have to meet three out of the following criteria. How easy is this one? It's tougher, folks. You're an extraordinary business person. You're an extraordinary athlete, um, extraordinary teacher, uh, professor. You can get an O1. What if you're not? Well, you don't. OK. Reasons to consider an O-1, you're capped out on your six, six years, you have a J-1, you're subject to the two-year home residence requirement. O-1 is a great visa, we love it. I've got people on O-1s been there for years, will continue to be there. Spouse gets an O-3, cannot work. O-2, essential support. Look, this is a narrow area, but, and it only applies to arts, motion picture, and television. But you bring over a director, you have to bring over their key essential people, and they can get O-2, so they work on the production. Uh, so the O2 is good. Let's jump over to the J1. By the way, this is called the smorgasbord of non-immigrant visas. Um, bring in J1 interns. Bring in trainees for up to 18 months. Um, remember, no productive employment on this. They're quite restrictive right now, but there's a lot of J1s in the United States. How many J1s in the United States? I think I saw the statistic um, uh, last year, year before, was like about 400,000. Uh, Bernie, could you repeat that number? 400,000, and how many H1s a year? Uh, 85,000, um, wow, uh, this is a big category. And by the way, cap exempt, um, let's try that one more time, what was I saying? Um, they are, uh, I just totally lost my train of thought. I'm trying to think of the next point. Um, I'm a boy, I can't chew and scratch my head at the same time. Um, that's two different things. I have to do one thing at a time. Give me a bow and arrow and I will hunt that deer. Bernie, keep on topic. Stop talking about manly things. Um, I'm just explaining why I lost my train of thought. I can only do one thing at a time. Here's the point that we're talking about. Pilot, hey, that was sexist, Bernie. Stop being sexist. Yeah, I apologize. Um, it's just me who can only do one thing at a time. Um, my wife, on the other hand, is amazing. She can do a hundred things at a time. But then again, she's a math PhD, so what can I say? I married up. Um, people like that one. I certainly did. Um, so, you know, when you have trouble doing more than one thing, marry a math PhD. They're very good at juggling. Uh, other trainee intern visas, pilot programs. Hey, this is really good. Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and Ireland. Four special uh, visas that come on a J-1. They do not need a sponsor. If you come from any of these countries, you can get a J-1 if you meet their requirements. H-3 trainee, I do like the H-3. Um, generally, this has to be a rigorous trainee program with only incidental employment. Um, I'm going to fast forward here. I'm watching my clock, and I know my jokes are running thin. So uh, we've got a lot of material to cover. So I'm going to do this. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the American Express ad a few years ago where the guy starts talking. E1 trainees, okay, we're done. Um, okay, um, Bernie, slow down. 
Um, Ichu, my favorite visa. Um, let's pick on a Japanese company, Toyota. A uh, Japanese company wants to build a plan, bring in its managers and executives. This is it. Executive manager or essential employee, similar to the L1, 50% owned by the treaty country. Uh, 80 countries have treaties with the United States. Uh, you can bring in essential employees. They have to be temporary. We love the E2. can often be approved for up to five years under the recipro reciprocity. Reciprocity. Did I say that right? Reciprocity schedule. Google that word, reciprocity schedule, because some countries will only get a three-month E, some countries will get a five-year E. It is the reciprocity schedule. Depends on how long the E2 is approved. You can be an investor or you can be an essential employee. E2, fabulous visa. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Um, the American Embassy in Tokyo processes so many E's. The American Embassy in Seoul, Korea, processes so many E's. Why? Because we have companies called Samsung. We have companies called Toyota. What visas are these key employees on? Usually E's or L's. Okay, religious workers. Come on, Bernie. What are you talking about? We just did a webinar, by the way, um, about last month. Um, we do a lot of these cases. Uh, I love doing them. Uh, religious workers, religious vocation, religious uh, you do not need ordained, um, so yes, you can be, you know, a priest, rabbi, um, religious vocation, monk, nun. You've taken your vows, etc. Uh, you could also be a, a religious professional, a teacher, instructor, a musical director. But you do have to have a spiritual element. Okay, so if you're just here for fundraising, uh, nope, we're not buying it. You're not an R1. By the way, about half of these cases are investigated. Uh, they consider there to be a lot of fraud in this arena. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, but, you know, often people want to help people. You know, this thing about we're going to help you, um, that's not how it goes, folks. In immigration law, you follow the rules we are dealing with. Have I said it enough times? Homeland security, enforcement. Um, don't do funny stuff. Please run away from it. Uh, immigrant visas. Wait a second, Bernie, what happened? You've been talking about non-immigrant visas? Yes. What is a non-immigrant visa? Well, it gives you the right to work in the United States or stay here for a certain period of time. Now we're talking about what? Immigrant visas. What is that? Well, it's called a green card. You never heard of a green card? Yes, it's green. Isn't it pink? It used to be pink. It used to be green. Went pink. Now it's back to green. And that's your green card. And what is it? Nice little card. It's got your picture. Security advisors. Hello. Security uh, enhanced features. Um, CIA, the story, not the last one, is that the CIA developed this amazing card with all these incredible features. The only problem is you can buy them downtown for 50 bucks on Alvarado Street. Um, no, they're not 50 bucks anymore. But they are fakes. And you have to be careful of the fakes. How do you know? I don't know. I'm not a document expert. Get yourself one of those little blue light things that the CBP guys do. Shine your blue light on it and see what happens. I don't know. Um, green card lottery. What is that? Oh, yeah. I was just saying about how hard it is to get a green card, and then the United States gives away every year, yes, folks, 50,000 green cards. Of course, they make it complicated. They actually issued last year something like 104,000 visas. Wait a second, Bernie. We, you told us your math is bad. Yes, my math is bad. So they send out 104,000 winners, and there's only 50,000 green cards? Yes. Which means you've got a... 50% chance of winning after you've won? Yes. Uh, they develop a pool and then they knock half of them out. Isn't that lovely? Uh, congratulations, you've been selected in the green card lottery. Six months later. Sorry, you didn't get a green card. What? I quit my job, sold my house, got, put the dogs in the pounds, and now you're telling me I don't get a green card? Yes, that's how it works. Starts in October and November. Do you need a lawyer? No. If you win, do you need a lawyer? I argue you do. I argue you do. I actually specialize in this program. Bernie, how many things do you specialize in? A lot. Um, because our success rate in converting a winner into a green card is pretty high. These are the countries that have not been eligible. These are the countries that give a lot of people. You can cross charge. So, you know, if you are born in India and you marry somebody from France, uh, you're both eligible to apply for the lottery. 
do I do the lottery? Yes, I do the lottery. Should I do the lottery? Yes, you should do the lottery. Why should you do the lottery? Well, it's a lottery. It's only got a small chance of success. The nation that has the highest success rate in being selected in the lottery is going one, going two, Australia. Yes, of course, it's Australia. You've got something under 5% chance. So apply five times, you've got 25% chance. I don't know. I don't do math. If you do five times and you've got 5% chance over five years, maybe you still only have 6% chance of being winning, of winning, or 4%. I don't know. I'm not good on statistics. The government is um, good at making up statistics. Sorry, Bernie. Stop being silly. Immigrant visa option, green card, family-based green card. I already mentioned that about 70% of green cards go to family. The only category worth looking at here is called immediate relative, that is spouse. So everybody says you want to get a green card, marry an American citizen. Hey, hold it, guys. Um, you want to get a green card, fall in love, and have a genuine marriage. I keep hearing this, oh, just marry an American citizen. Big, big, big mistake. Um, how long does it take to get a green card through marriage? About four years. How do you keep a phony relationship together for four years? You don't. The government catches you. They pretty much always win. Don't, at least don't call my office if it's not a genuine marriage. We don't touch him, and you'd be silly to touch him. If you hear about him, please discourage them. The penalty is only what? Immigration Marriage Fraud Amendment Act 1987. The penalty is going one, going two, going three, five years in prison, and a quarter of a million dollar fine. Do they ever go to jail? Yes. I had one of my clients, um, she didn't retain me, but she ended up going to jail. Um, fraudulent marriage, they wanted to make an example of her. Um, don't do it, because um, you keep hearing about it, and it's very, very passe. Here's the good news. If it's a legitimate marriage, you get a green card within about, um, conditional green card within six to eight months, work permit within two to three months. Um, so that's it. Uh, also minor children of U.S. citizens. So that's the immediate relative category. It's a good one. Um, there's a few others. Um, you can look at all these categories. Bottom line is they all have ridiculously long waiting lines. So I keep hearing, well, my brother and sister, you know, as an American citizen, can they file 10 years, 15 years, blah, blah, blah. What about this F2A category? It says three to five year. This is where your foreign national marries a green card holder. There's one thing about foreign nationals, people with funny accents like me sometimes, unless they're Canadian and they don't have funny accents. Um, most of the time. Um, they marry permanent residents. They marry the girl from the village back home. That's what happens. Boys marry foreigners. Girls marry foreigners. Correct word, of course, is um, international, not foreigner, because we're not foreign. Um, we are, well, I'm an American citizen, although I am a dual citizen, uh, having naturalized, what, 20, 30 years ago. So get to your point, Bernie. Um, you marry a permanent resident, and uh, you've got a green card waiting line of about three years, so you're going to need to have an H-1. Let's talk about some others. EB-1, first preference immigrant visa petition. Alien of extraordinary ability, outstanding researcher professor with three years' experience. Managerial executive, I already did that under the L-1. So let's give these things another name. Alien of extraordinary ability, I call that mother of O-1. Outstanding researcher and professor. That's not only in research, that's also in private institutions, if you have at least three full-time employees. EB1C, managerial executive, green card, absolutely available uh, if it's a substantial company. So we have employment-based, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth preference. We had family-based, first, second, third, and fourth preference. We finished family, we now want to employment-based green cards. Let's talk about EB2, Schedule A Group 2, my favorite, exceptional ability in art, science, or performing arts that has to be employer sponsored. Um, Bernie, my lawyer never told me about that. I know because your lawyer doesn't know about it. Uh, they should, but they don't. Uh, this is somebody, uh, EB2, other category, advanced degree, master or higher, bachelor plus five years of experience. Bachelor probably has to be a four-year degree most of the time. Or national interest waiver. What is that? National interest waiver, NIW, very popular because foreign nationals can self-sponsor. Foreign nationals can self-sponsor for first preference and second preference. And then you have another category, special handling for university and college teachers. What's that about? That is when there's a teaching element and the uh, person is going to be working for a university 
and uh, you have to file within 18 months of selection and uh, no longer have to prove there's no Americans. You basically only have to prove that your foreign national is the most qualified. Repeat, most qualified. So universities get a lot of slack, uh, slack, that would be the right word, in terms of uh, being able to hire uh, the best, most qualified teacher. Makes sense. Third preference. Third preference, that is the bachelor's degree category or a skilled worker with two years of experience. There is an other worker category that's for the nannies and uh, other uh, workers that require less than two years. Waiting line on third preference, uh, currently about eight years. Wait a second, Bernie. Eight years, yep. So you want to hire this nanny. You file for a uh, other worker perm under the third preference, and uh, she gets a green card in eight years. Correct. Uh, and then what happens during the eight years? I don't know. She has to wait abroad. So wait a second, Bernie. Let me understand this. Uh, you're going to file for somebody as your nanny, and it's going to take eight years. By then, the kids are going to be in college already. So why did you need to file? Well, yeah, we have a problem. I spoke about it earlier. Hopefully, Congress will fix the quota. The quota isn't ridiculous. It's absurd. But then again, this is not a political rave. Uh, it's a reality. So EB2 versus EB3. This is my biggest problem at the moment. Okay? Why is it a problem? Because we have so many people who filed under the employment-based third preference, and they want to upgrade to EB2, which is the master's degree category. So they filed on the bachelor's degree category, they want to upgrade. Those of you HR managers have this every day. Oh, I'm stuck in the third preference waiting line. I want to jump. I'm born in India. I'm born in China. I'm stuck in the ridiculous waiting line. Well, if the legitimate job position requires a master's degree, I don't care that you, foreign worker, have a master's degree. The question is, does this job require at minimum a bachelor's degree? If it does, we upgrade. We start all over again, but we get to keep our place in the waiting line. It's going to be mainly Indian and Chinese nationals who are going to uh, agitate, advocate would be the correct word, uh, for an upgrade, but they have to meet the requirements. So, what is a perm labor cert? Is that some sort of a hairdo where you get curly hair? No, no, no. Stop being silly, Bernie. Um, the perm labor certification is where the employer advertises the, shop, the job, goes through good faith recruitment, and proves that there are no U.S. workers who are minimally qualified to do the position. You get your perm approval, takes three or four months. You then file your immigrant visa petition, show that the foreign national's employer uh, is qualified. Um, the employer is able to pay the salary, and then you apply for an adjustment of status. That's the final stage of the green card. Everything is beautiful. How long does this all take? Usually about two years. But if you're born in India or China and you're a bachelor's degree category, five to eight years. Some people say the Indian third preference quota is not eight years. It's 20 years. It's 30 years. It's 40 years. I don't want to depress so many of our well-qualified Indian nationals, but it's ridiculous. And hopefully Congress is going to fix that. What are you talking about, Bernie? I'm talking about this, numbers. What is this? This is your visa bulletin. Google the word visa bulletin, all of you. Um, you will see this chart. If you're in the immigration business, you have to understand it. First preference, current for everybody. That is the extraordinary ability folks, the managerial transfers, the EB1s, no waiting line. EB2, that's the master's degree. This is what I was ranting and raving about. So you have a master's degree, you come from China, and your waiting line is um, February 08. Uh, we are now in February 2013. Uh, that would tell me five years. So it's a five-year wait. No. It depends how many people are on the waiting line. It could be a six-year wait or a seven-year wait. Or we could believe that Congress is going to fix the problem and it will be a two- or three-year wait. I believe Congress is going to fix the problem. The amount of money that's being spent on this to lobby Congress, Congress cannot be so stupid to make, oops, I don't know if I should be rude, uh, Congress should not be so foolish uh, as to ignore this problem and chase away the best and the brightest people. Now, what if you come from India? Well, just add another four years to the waiting line. Okay, 04, 10-year waiting line. Bernie, oh, that's nine years, actually. So I come from India. I have a master's degree. I'm stuck in a nine-year waiting line. Well, some people say it's really longer. Are they going to fix it? What percentage of H-1Bs go to India? Hmm. 50? 60? 
Uh, yeah, something like that. So we've got all these amazing tech workers uh, almost supporting the entire infrastructure of our advanced world. And what are we going to do? We're going to send them all back home. They're all educated in America. They're all super smart. And we're going to send them all back home. And then we're going to suddenly discover that China's gross national product is bigger than America's. It's going to happen the next year or two. And then two years from now, India's gross natural product is going to be, and we're going to be in third place. Why? We sent them all up. Bernie, get out of the politics, OK? That may happen anyway. Um, yeah, but at least if we can hold on to some of the good ones, America used to be a nation of immigrants. It's still a nation of immigrants. We just don't welcome immigrants anymore. Um, and that's why we're chasing all the bright folks home, because India and China get the same annual quota as Liechtenstein. That's smart, right? Liechtenstein and India have the same quota. I love it. Uh, third preference, waiting lines. There you are. You come from India. You only have a bachelor's degree. 11 or 12 year wait. Come from China. You know, six, seven year wait. And everybody else, you come from South Africa. May 07. May 07. Um, let's do the math. Take off my shoes. Uh, no, I don't need to do my shoes for that. Let's just use the fingers. 0, 7, 8, 9, 10, blah, blah, blah. Five year wait? Yes, yeah, something like that. Five or six years for a green card uh, for everybody else. Filipino born at another year or two. Other workers, that's the religious workers. Uh, scratch that. Other workers, that's the nanny category, less than two years. Fourth preference, that's the religious worker, all current. And if your priority date is current, you can then file your 485 adjustment of status. You see the point at the bottom. You have to wait until your priority date comes up. All right, let's fast forward. Perm issues, are there lots of perm issues? Don't tailor the job to fit. Don't put in too many foreign languages. The one thing us foreigners speak is foreign languages. I speak Afrikaans. Um, all of about 2 million people speak the language, maybe three now. Um, so we put in a requirement, must speak Afrikaans, guaranteed denial. Um, so you've got to make sure that the foreign national qualifies, cannot generally use experience gained with the employer. Uh, common green card issues, start your green card within 4.5 years. Other immigrant visas, I already dealt with that. EB4, religious worker, mentioned that. EB5, oh, my new favorite. I am so busy with EB5 work, folks. This is a situation where uh, an investor decides to put a half a million dollars uh, into a regional center or buy a business. It's actually a million dollars, but it can be reduced down to half a million if it's in a high unemployment, targeted employment zone. A rural area, and um, this doesn't really apply to HR, but a lot of individuals, investors, half a million bucks to buy a green card. Bernie, did you say buy a green card? Yeah, it's pretty much buying a green card, and what's wrong with that? Um, well, it's not the American way. Uh, really? Okay, I'll buy that. It's not the American way to buy a green card. I got it. Uh, but what if you create 10 jobs, and what if you bring in much needed capital? Well, fine. Okay, you can buy a green card. Half a million bucks, send a check. Uh, in the mail, the green card will be in the mail. Not so easy, folks. Takes a couple of years, but uh, we're very active with that. Maintaining a green card. OK, now we've got a green card. How do we maintain it? Uh, I tell my clients not to be absent for more than six months. If they are, they need to um, apply for a reentry permit. Keep your ties with the US. File your tax returns. All right, final topic of the day, naturalization. I want to become an American. Some countries allow dual citizenship. Generally, the rule is four years and nine months. If you get a green card through marriage to a U.S. citizen, two years and nine months, you have to be present in the U.S. for 50% of the time. Dual citizenship varies. China doesn't allow it. India does allow it. South Africa, I had to get special permission from the South Africans. America has no problem with duals. We just don't recognize them. So if you're from China, scratch that, India or South Africa, and you commit treason, we will hang you. OK? So I know you think you've got a South African passport, but if you've got an American passport, and you commit treason, America will hang you. Yes, we have the death penalty for treason. And um, sorry, Bernie, you're getting weird again. Um, no, but it's true. Um, you've got to be an American citizen to commit treason. And if you commit treason, you get hanged. Uh, or you can get hanged. Um, so there we are, Bernie Orstov. There he is, smiling and happy as always. Hey, when you've got a little eight-year-old kid, you are pretty much always happy. My kid is cute. I also have a 28-year-old kid. My problem with my 28-year-old kid is he's not as grown up as my 8-year-old kid. All right, stop that, Bernie. It's time for questions. Let's move over.
to the questions. I hope we have hundreds and hundreds of questions. I hope you are uh, enjoying today's show. Um, oh, I forgot to mention something because I see this as one of the questions. Um, medical professions. I did mention that um, it's not really a webinar, but on March the 2nd in New York City, we have a New York, um, uh, hey, thanks for the nice comments. Love the humor. Ha, ha, ha. Um, cool. I once got a comment, stop the jokes. This stuff's not so funny. Um, okay, March the 2nd in New York at NYU, Roosevelt, we do our doctor seminar. That will be, uh, gosh, just in a week or two done by Abi Friedman, one of the senior lawyers, and Naveen Bora, the uh, manager in our New York office. And uh, if you're a physician, uh, let's go for it. All right, we're going to fly through this. Will we be able to obtain copies of the slides? Yes. Uh, are you certain that the F1s are exempt from FICA and Medicare under OPT no matter how long they've been in F1 status? No. I refuse to be certain about any tax advice because there are treaties that regulate this. Uh, so watch out for your treaties. That's why I do not give tax advice, because you have your basic rule about certain exemptions. I'm not even going to say which ones, because that could be wrong. I do not give tax advice. I'm not allowed to give tax advice. I'm not qualified to give tax advice. And I don't want to end up having to reimburse you uh, or the IRS, because I gave the wrong tax advice. Uh, but our tax advisors are saying it is only for five years. Um, I would suggest that you follow the advice of your tax advisor uh, and that there are caps and limits uh, as to how long you can uh, receive the exemption. And if the person's been in the United States for more than five years, that exemption may not be applicable. Yes, yes, yes. Um, is the, I'm going to fly through these questions here. Um, love the humor. Thank you. Is cap gap only available under change of status? Yes. Uh, you have to be in F1 status to get cap gap. Is cap gap protection only for those filing under change of status, not consular processing? I believe the answer is yes. Uh, oh, this is a nice comment. Thanks for your sense of humor and still getting to the point. You know, I used to be a teacher, and I found that um, students don't concentrate unless you make jokes. Um, this person's left, but I'm going to answer the question, because questions are usually really good. If the employee does not have OPT, would premium processing be a good choice, or is premium processing never a good choice? No, there are situations where premium processing is required. I just try to discourage it, because um, it's not really first class. It's just fast. Uh, are there any exceptions for medical professionals like psychiatrists? Oh, yes. Um, doctors in underserved areas. We have three or four lawyers who do that. You may have to fly to um, New York uh, and attend our seminar. Um, anyway, uh, you don't have to fly to New York. Um, we actually have a little secret. Uh, if you go to our website, wolfstorff.com, we do have recordings of pretty much all of our um, programs, including our doctor programs. And we've got lots of them. We do one part, two part. Um, great summary. What about the humanitarian type of visa option? Oh my gosh. Uh, humanitarian parole. Yes, we do humanitarian visas. We do refugees. Uh, we do 100,000 refugees. We do asylums. We do TPS, temporary protected status. Uh, we do family unity. Uh, my favorite new one, DACA, D-A-C-A, -A, for the kids. This is why President Obama won the election. He gave DACA to the kids about a month before. I'm not being cynical, but it was a smart move. Uh, we have DACA webinars. We have DACA uh, experts. What is parole? Uh, that's where a criminal, no, stop that, Bernie. Um, what is, it sounds like parole is where a criminal is out on parole. No, parole in immigration is a good thing. The government under 212 AD 5, that's the section of the law, can parole anybody into the United States with or without, um, used to be in the uh, uh, Attorney General, we parole the Cuban um, refugees and we parole people in. Parole is uh, when you have a pending adjustment of status to green card, 
they give you advance parole, which is permission to come back into the United States. Um, oh, boy, nice comments. I shouldn't repeat them. Put them in writing. Um, tell my wife. Um, um, Okay, I'm looking to launch an agency for J1 interns to come over, wondering what the likelihood of it being approved. Heard mixed messages on this. I can explain further if need, and they're giving the name and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, J1 sponsorship. Look, the reality is that if you're a big corporate program, I just got an approval for J1 sponsorship uh, to bring in foreign nationals. I should do a program on that. Uh, many, you can bring in trainees. There's so many different categories, specialist categories. Uh, trainee categories, but big companies are using the J1 uh, to effectively bring people in. Um, so the answer is yes, 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 yes. Uh, you look like Gerald Butler. Let me tell you, uh, no, that picture is not photoshopped. Uh, Gerald Butler, no. Um, uh, yeah, maybe more like Gerard Depardieu. Uh, then Gerald Butler, but thank you. Wow, uh, what a compliment. Um, tell my wife, uh, do you think the PERM certification program is likely to change with you? I hope so. I really do. It's ridiculous. I hate the PERM program. I do it all the time. But you know, you're advertising a job for Americans to apply, and I'm sorry if you've ever been an unemployed American, it's no fun to apply for a job where they already have somebody selected. I mean, you're supposed to hire the foreign national as the American applicant, but in reality, they never do. Because if you do hire the foreign national, the perm is denied, unless you have multiple positions available. So, um, humanitarian summary. I don't know where to go on that. Uh, do you think DACA is counterproductive? Now, you've already seen my political beliefs. I do not believe children are illegal. I do not believe human beings are illegal. I do believe we need to follow the law. But these kids who are brought by their parents, you know, every time I talk to them, they sound and look more American than I do. And, um, you know, we, we, we finally cut them a break. I think it's irreversible. I think it's going to be close to it. They're always the valedictorians. So many of these kids, okay, are, they look American, they sound American, they don't speak Spanish, most of them. Um, you know, those who came from Mexico. And uh, the bottom line is they're going to get work permission. So do I think it's counterproductive? No. My understanding is that, um, firstly, I would say it's the American way. Give the kids a break. We don't hold kids responsible for the acts of their parents. And, um, you know, they deserve a chance, in my opinion. Um, if someone was working on an F1, does it, or is it possible for him to produce a full-time experience? And if he does, then what is the maximum time period he or she can work? You know, uh, the general rule is during the school year, up to 20 hours a week, or during vacation, uh, full-time, 40 hours a week, with OPT, uh, 40 hours a week. Uh, so there are considerable restrictions, but please make sure that student has work authorization. Um, okay, there's a follow-up question here, and I've got to make sure I get it. I mean in terms of failing to offer them any permanent solution while eating. Oh, yeah. Uh, the question is, DACA counterproductive in terms of it's just a temporary work permit? So this is the whole thing. Is If you're a uh, DACA kid, that is a kid who came here illegally with their parents without permission uh, and are undocumented, meaning illegally they crossed the border without a visa uh, or they've otherwise allowed their status to expire, they can now get this temporary work authorization uh, for the early childhood arrivals. No, I believe that once we have let them in, what are we going to do? Round these kids up, put them in box cars, and ship them across the border? Yes, I have heard a politician say that, but I just don't think America is that heartless to round up these kids who look like when they live next door, and they're on your kid's baseball team and basketball team, and they're on the valedictorian at your school, and you didn't know they were without status, uh, you're going to put them in prison and handcuff them and send them abroad? Really? Is this what America's going to do? Hmm. I don't think so. I have faith. And, um, but then again, I'm naive. Um, so I think it's going to happen. I think we're going to pass the DREAM Act. 
is it possible to transition from an O1 to a green card? Um, oh boy, the questions are rolling in and I promise to answer all of them. So I better go fast before uh, I run over time. Is it possible to transition from O1 to a green card since it would be under the da 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 Yes. Very often O1s can self-sponsor and go to a green card, uh, but they have to be more extraordinary. Okay? You got that one? More extraordinary. Okay? How good can you be? Nobel Prize winner? Not quite required, but you have to be pretty extraordinary. If a person has an experience letter and it does not show that it was full-time or part-time, then by default what it is going to be considered by USCIS in auditing the perm. Hey folks, you know, we need to get the facts, okay? These experience letters, uh, they don't always mean everything, okay? People make up phony things in immigration. Be careful of that. The experience letter has to be genuine. So if somebody says they worked abroad for two years, make sure they work full time. Make sure that they have pay stubs. Make sure that they've got tax returns. Because you know the government doesn't always believe these phony letters. Okay? Well, they're not phony, but sometimes people do puffery. And we don't just buy your letter. We want to make sure that you really did work there if you have genuine experience. So um, please make sure that that experience is genuine. Uh, I'm going to read this one out. Thank you ver for your very helpful presentation. I enjoyed the added humor. Well, thank you. Of course, our government has done an excellent job of providing much comedic material. It's it's true. It's kind of like um, it's it's like Franz Kafka. It's the trial. It's weird, you know. Understanding immigration law. I mean, I've been doing it 30 years, and I still. Uh, any option for a medical condition, rare cancer type? Wow, how sad. Yes, uh, humanitarian parole. Uh, we have these cases. We have um, children who are uh, challenged, um, and there are benefits available in some instances, but they are discretionary. So, um, but you know, if they have a rare cancer, the big issue is who's going to fit the bill. Uh, U.S. government does not want to pay for foreigners' medical. Uh, treatment and you know a lot of Americans support that is why do my tax dollars have to go to supporting this kid so my favorite case I had the Shriners case they brought over this kid who had burns and she was here for 25 years and they fixed her up real good and um, boy then she got fixed and had to go home so I had to she couldn't even speak the language of her native country uh, it was a very enjoyable learning experience well thank you again uh, thanks and regards. Wish you luck for the future. Well, I wish you all good luck for the future. It is now 2.15 and we are abrupt. Oh, another thank you. Uh, we are going to abruptly stop because I've been going too long. Uh, this will be recorded. You will be hearing from me. Please encourage your friends to uh, sign up to our newsletter. We have lots of these. These webinars are all free. You can get any of your questions answered. And um, I'm going to say farewell. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed this um, hour and a half or so, and I hope I've answered all of your immigration questions. If not, you know how to reach me, 1-800-VISA-LAW, Bernard at Wolfsdorf. Send me comments. If I don't get any, I feel I didn't connect, and obviously I enjoy myself. Um, have a wonderful day, everybody. Have faith. We're going to get there. Immigration is going to get fixed, hopefully in my lifetime. Farewell and goodbye. Until next time, adieu. Um, that's A-D-I-E-U. Uh, my French is terrible. Thanks, folks. Bye.